It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, I, I want to start a very uh, straightforward question um, to the Premier. Premier, when the NDP support our one of confidence motion in the House later this afternoon, will you obey the will of the House or will you put the Liberal Party first once again? Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, we are focusing on creating jobs, on making the investments that we know are needed for people to thrive, for communities to thrive, for infrastructure to, from Leeds, and for come to, order. to be able to grow and expand in the province, Mr. Speaker. That is our focus. I look forward to the, uh, look forward to the response from the uh, opposition parties on the fall economic statement tomorrow. I look forward to uh, explaining to people across the province our plan for those investments in people and in infrastructure and in uh, a business climate that is, uh, that is going to be able to bring investment to the province and what we're going to do to stimulate that kind of investment, Mr. Speaker, because I believe that is the way forward. It's a sharp difference from what the party opposite would like to do, Mr. Speaker, which is cut and slash. I do not believe that is the way forward. I believe that investing in our future is yes, the way sir. that we need to go. Thank you, supplementary. Well, sadly, it's just what I expected. Order. It, it sounds just like Dalton McGuinty all over again. Sure does. Uh, we have a party here that um, wasted $1.1 billion to save two Liberal seats. He didn't care about somebody who in Milton could use some treatment to prolong her life and spend time with her family to fight cancer. That didn't matter to you. What mattered to you was saving two Liberal seats in the last election campaign. That's your priorities. This motion says that we simply do not trust the Liberals to run this province anymore. That the cries from seniors, men and women across the province, that enough is enough has been heard by at least one party, the PC party. If the NDP have the courage to do what's right and support our motion, Question. will you listen to the voice of the majority of members of the legislature, or will you again put the Liberal Party first here, here. each and every time? Here, here. Here, here. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I am listening to people across Order. the province who are telling me that they elected a minority parliament and they expect us to do everything in our power to make that minority parliament work, Mr. Speaker. And let me just, let me just say, um, the, there has been a lot of legislation that has moved through in the last few weeks. So the Local Food Act was passed yesterday, Mr. Speaker. The Wireless Services Agreement, Supporting Small Business Act, Consumer Protections, the Financial Accountability Officer legislation, Family Caregiver Leave legislation, Protecting Kids from Skin Cancer, Mr. Speaker. The legislature is working, and it's it's very gratifying, Mr. Speaker, that we've been able to find common ground, and we've been able to put those, bring those pieces of legislation to the House and move them through, Mr. Speaker. And that's because that's because the opposition parties and our government have been able to find a way to work together. That's what the people expect of us, Mr. Speaker. That's what we're going to continue to do. The only reason things move to the House, Premier, is because we agreed we to do. clear the decks. We, we see your job plan. We're the ones that pass that stuff through. We clear the decks and see what you've got. But ten minutes, ten months later, Premier. All we see is a vacuous Liberal agenda, putting more fluff into the system. you got all kinds of balloon animals and card tricks to try to distract attention. You don't have a plan for jobs. We have a plan for jobs. We have a plan to put our economy back on track with more jobs and better take-home pay. My view, let's get on with the job. And if the NDP finally discovers their moral compass and says they're on the side of taxpayers like we are, why don't you actually listen to the will of the House when that happens later on this afternoon? Yeah. Here. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, I just don't believe that those 2,000 plus young people who have been able to find uh, positions because Order of our youth Leeds employment Grenville, strategy think time. that that's not important, Mr. Speaker. I don't think that the people who have jobs at the Ford plant think that the $70 million that we are investing to make sure that Ford can uh, compete in the global economy, I don't Remember think that they Renfrew, don't believe that that's important, Mr. Speaker. I think that the people who live in northern and rural communities think that the $100 million infrastructure fund Remember that we put in place is order. exactly what's needed in order to be able to invest in their future. I think the people who are, and I will say this, Mr. Speaker, who are part of the horse racing industry, who see that they have a sustainable future, 
think that that is a very good thing, Mr. Speaker. So we are doing the work that is necessary. I, uh, I need to hear. Finish, wrap up, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the, the people who met with us yesterday from the chicken farmers, Mr. Speaker, they're very pleased very that our government has taken a strong position on supply yeah. management. Thank you. We've made that position nationally, and we will continue to adv advocate for that. No question. The Leader of the Opposition. Left of it. Come on. Look, <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that. I talked to the folks in the horse racing industry as soon as. Uh, Monday. And, and Premier, if they heard that answer, they would say horse feathers, horse feathers. but not exactly. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry, excuse me. Excuse me. Stop the clock. Uh, I, I had two things in my head at the same time. I didn't hear who it was directed to, and uh, the, the Minister of the Environment will come to order. Uh, a direction, please. Um, to the Premier, Speaker, um, I think the Premier's lost touch. And I think she's surrounded herself with. Um, Liberal insiders, uh, those that are benefiting from the inside deals, and I think the the reason why she's not answering my question on the want of confidence motion. Order. The motion basically says that Ontarians have lost trust in the Liberal government to run this province anymore. That that enough is enough. I think the reason why she's dodging those questions is because the fix is in. That no matter what happens, no matter what they do, the NDP will give them a get out of jail free card every time because you're basically one and the same. We'll see what the vote is later today. We'll see if the NDP has any kind of moral compass. Thank but you. the bottom line for me, we need change. For a Thank better, you. strong, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, I just, I just want to be clear with the uh, Leader of the Opposition. I do not take for granted the position that we are in. I believe very strongly that we have to earn the respect of the people of this province every single day. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we are working so hard to do what we believe is right based on the evidence that we see around us, Mr. Speaker. We have constrained spending over the last number of years. We have overachieved on our deficit reduction targets. We believe, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, that now it is very important that we make the investments that are going to allow this economy to thrive, that we make the investments in infrastructure, in the future of people, making sure, Mr. Speaker, that people have a decent retirement, that they have a strong That's education her. system, a strong health care system, and making sure that we put in place the business conditions that will allow businesses to thrive. I call on the Thank Leader you. of the Opposition to support us in getting Thank the small businesses. Newspaper ad. So now we understand the problem. Yep. The Premier says the only problem is the Liberals are a bunch of overachievers. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's uh, look what you have overachieved. We've lost 300,000 well-paying manufacturing Shame. jobs while well, you added 300,000 to the government payroll. Hydro rates have doubled and they're going through the roof. The debt has doubled our Minister profit, Rural Affairs, come to order. Ontario, that always been the engine that drove this great country, is now first in debt and last in jobs. I want to see an Ontario and have a turnaround plan to make us first in jobs and last in debt. A place where people come from all over the world to settle here. I think the problem is you're out of ideas. You got 36 panels going. You're the same as Dalton McGuinty, and you got them in your back pocket, and this problem is going to continue to spiral. I think it's time for change. I think people across our province are saying Question. enough is enough. Let's get rid of the Liberals. Let's build a stronger Ontario for our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, the fact is that as a province, we have we have uh, created and attracted more jobs than other jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker. The fact is we went through a huge economic downturn, and we have in the order 400,000 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker. So we have we have come a very long way, and I am not suggesting that there isn't more to do, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I'm suggesting the opposite. I'm suggesting that we have to take this moment in our history very seriously, and we have to, as a province, make a decision. We have to decide collectively whether we are going to go down a path of cutting and slashing and diminishing the economy in this province, Mr. Speaker, which is what the PCs are advocating.
advocating. They are advocating that we cut services, that we cut the public service, that we diminish the services that are available to people in health care, in education. I don't believe that's the way that we should go, Mr. Speaker. I believe that we should make the investments that are necessary to allow the economy to expand, yeah, yeah. to support Thank businesses. And Thank you. Final supplementary. The bottom line is the people of Ontario don't trust the Liberals anymore. No. You, you bankrupt the province, you've chased jobs out of Ontario, and you put us deep, deep order. Debt. You know what, Premier, as I travel around the province, and I'm sure you do too, I hear two things about your gas plant scandal. I hear one, somebody should go to jail over this, and number two, I hear the Liberals should pay that money back, right. not the taxpayers of the province of Ontario. The problem is, I don't know where the NDP draws a line. I don't know why they give you a pass each and every time. I hope they will screw up the courage to actually be on the side of taxpayers like we are and say the time for the Liberal corrupt government, it's time to go. Let's bring real change to our province of Ontario and follow the vote later on. Thank you. Premier. They have no answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I don't, I don't think there was a question in there, but the reality is that we are intent on making the investments and putting the supports in place so that, uh, that people have what they need, the services that they need, so that businesses have a climate that they can thrive in. And part of that is the Small Businesses Act, Mr. Speaker. And we would really very much believe that it would be important to get that act passed so we can support those small businesses and can give them a break on their payroll taxes. That bill is being blocked in committee, Mr. Speaker, and it would be of great assistance to the small businesses in this province if the opposition would work with us and get that through, Mr. Speaker. I also believe that making the investments in infrastructure that are necessary in our rural and northern That's a true story. Minister responsible for seniors, I don't need that. Thank you. I know we face challenges, and that's why it's extremely important that we make the right decisions at this point, Mr. Speaker, that will set us up for the future that Ontario can achieve. That's why those investments are so important, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're going to continue to look for ways to support the economy and make sure that it can thrive. Do you question the leader of the third party? Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Liberal government has for years insisted that policies of tax giveaways and harmonization would actually improve productivity and spur investment in our province. Can the Premier explain why then Ontario ranks ninth out of ten provinces when it comes to productivity growth? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the leader of the third party raises a very good question about the particular um, configuration of tax credits and so on that uh, that are in place. And one of the things that uh, the finance minister will talk about tomorrow is that it's important that we actually do make sure that those are working, that they are having the intended impact, Mr. Speaker. It's one of the things that uh, Don Drummond has spoken to us about, and it's something that I think is very important that we look at. So I'm glad that the leader of the third party has raised it, but we're already on it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, since the Liberals were first elected, Ontario lost 300,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs. And despite promise after promise, those jobs, Speaker, those good jobs have not come back. Today, 110 women and men who worked at the Kellogg's plant in London have learned that they'll be losing their jobs come January. Is the Premier admitting that the government's policy of no-strings-attached giveaways hasn't been working? No, Mr. Speaker. What I'm saying is that there are a number of there are a number of things at work here. One of them is that we need to look at the tax credit system and make sure that uh, the tax credits that are in place have the desired impact. And we are doing that, Mr. Speaker. And the minister will talk about that tomorrow. The other reality is that the manufacturing sector has changed. So that if we look at when I visit manufacturing plants across the province, as I have, Mr. Speaker, whether it's in food processing or whether it's in another sector, what I see is that
that advanced manufacturing A needs a different set of skills, Mr. Speaker, and B needs a different size of workforce. And so we're in a transition. It is a difficult transition, and that's why it's very important that in our diverse economy we play to our strengths and we make sure that we put in place the supports where we can thrive. That's the work that we're doing, Mr. Speaker, and I would welcome her support in that. Final supplementary. Speaker, over the last 10 years of Liberal government, 300,000 good manufacturing jobs have disappeared. Our province has the highest electricity rates in the country, the lowest productivity growth, and an unemployment, unemployment rate that is above the national average. The Premier still insists the plan is working, while at the same time her actions seem to suggest something different. Speaker, When are people like the women and men losing jobs in London going to see some real action from the Liberal government? Well, Mr. Speaker, there are, uh, there are jobs across the province that have come back. There are factories that are expanding, there are businesses that are expanding, Mr. They're Speaker. But as I said before, it's very important that we play to our strengths and we find those sectors, Mr. Speaker, that have the capacity to, capacity to expand. And I will just say, wearing my hat as Minister of Agriculture and Food, that is one of the sectors where there is huge potential to expand. And that's why I've put a challenge in place, Mr. Speaker, to the food processing and the food producing industry to do what they can to expand with our support. We're we're looking at the regulatory scheme, Mr. Speaker. We've got in place risk management programs. We're working with the sector through the local food fund, the $30 million over the next three years, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we make those investments that are going to allow that agriculture sector to expand. That's what I mean by playing to our strengths, Mr. Speaker, and that is how we are going to grow Thank Ontario. You. Your question? Thank you, Speaker. Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. The Premier says she wants greater openness and transparency, but she doesn't seem willing to walk the walk, Speaker. Why did Liberal members just this morning vote against asking the Auditor General to look into the $180 million the government spent on their cancelled nuclear expansion plans? Did the Auditor General say no? Did the Auditor General say no? No, she didn't. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I appreciate the question. I don't. I, I haven't seen the uh, the answer from uh, this morning, and so I don't know exactly what went on at the committee. But what I can say is that I have answered this question before about the 180 million dollars. That the 180 million dollars was spent in order to prepare for a new nuclear uh, bill that we have determined through the evidence that is not necessary. But that work that has been done is is not for naught. It is absolutely work that can be used if and when we determine that we uh, we need to go ahead. So I think that that $180 million is money that was well spent, the information is necessary, and Answer. that work will stand us in good stead if a decision should change in the future, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians know that the Liberals can't be trusted to tell the whole story on money wasted in the energy sector. The Liberals claimed it would cost $40 million to cancel the Oakville gas plant. The auditor showed it would cost 20 times as much. The Liberals claimed it would cost $190 million to cancel the Mississauga gas plant. The auditor showed that was off by $85 million. Now, I'm disappointed that Mr. Hudak's Conservatives chose to vote against transparency as well, but we know not to expect very much from them except for political gains. But the Premier said she wants to be open. So why did Liberal members vote to stop the independent Auditor General of this province from determining the full cost of cancelling their nuclear expansion plans? Mr. Speaker, I, 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 mean, I think the Honourable uh, uh, Leader of the NDP, uh, in her question, points out the obvious fact that the Liberals do not have a majority on any legislative committee, and in fact we were joined by the opposition in opposing the motion, and the reason why is that the motion itself was flawed, Mr. Speaker. The uh, suppositions behind it in terms of the costing for uh, uh, that have been put forward in the motion were incorrect, Mr. Speaker, and the committee, and I think we all agree committees should be free to do their work, deemed with the support of the official opposition that it was not an appropriate motion. If the honourable member wants to talk about Transparency, Mr. Speaker. I will talk about our Premier who asked the Auditor General to look into the Oakville gas plant, who has appeared in front of the Justice Committee. In fact, I understand will be appearing again in front of the Justice Committee to answer questions and comes to this House virtually every day to answer questions on a project that the leader of the NDP wanted to cancel herself.
Final supplementary. Speaker, for families and businesses paying the highest electricity bills in Canada, this is a pretty simple issue. They're tired of watching the Liberal government use the hydro system as a political football and then sticking them with the bill. We called for the auditor to look at how much money was spent planning for a project that was shelved and how much more would be spent if this government or a future government then takes that plan off the shelf again. Why is the Premier scared, afraid, frightened, worried about an independent review of the decision they made? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, deferring new nuclear is the right decision. We're not going to invest $15 billion in power that we don't need because we have a surplus at this time. Order. The Mr. member Speaker, from Stormont come to order. The member from expenditures. Bush, and Sound come to order. The member from Northumberland come to order. Speaker, all of OPG's expenditures have been reviewed by the Ontario Energy Board, That's right. an independent semi-judicial agency, and posted publicly on their website. Publicly on their website, the information they're asking the committee to work on has been published on the OPA website. Please Thank refer you. to the OPA website, and you'll get the answer that you need. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, they have no plan for energy. All they do is criticize their base out there in the community for calling us and thanking us for the decisions that we're doing because they have no policy. Mr. Thank you. Question, the member from the Carlton. My question is to the Premier. Yes, Premier. Um, yesterday in Justice Committee, Joanne Butler once again uh, joined us, and she confirmed yet again that everyone in Cabinet, including yourself, knew that the true cost of the cancelled Oakville power plant would have been more than $40 million. Yet, untroubled by the fact that you stand here day in and day out and you deny that, you refuse to call a judicial inquiry, you refuse to appear before committee, and you refuse to put forward a confidence motion on the floor of this House. So the only thing we can do as official, the official opposition is table an opposition motion, which we are today, to talk about the trust of this government, which has been lost by the public. We'll be having a vote on whether or not the majority of the House including the people of Ontario, have uh, had their confidence in you drained. And it's going to be up to you whether or not you're going to ignore or listen to the will of the people. If it passes, will you do the Thank honorable you. thing and resign? Mr. Speaker, and I know that the uh, House Leader is going to want to speak to the technicalities of the committee and the supplementary, but if the reason that the opposition is bringing forward the motion, if the reason is that I won't appear at committee, then they can cancel their motion because I've got a date. I'm here, going here. on December 3rd. Here, here, here. Here, here. Um, I've Not said, them. I've, I, I've been there once, Mr. Speaker. I've told the committee everything that I know. I've been asked to come back again. I am going back again on December 3rd, Mr. Speaker. I will answer the questions again. But the fact is, I have given the committee all the information that I have. As I said, we have a date now for December 3rd. It was just a matter of uh, arranging our schedules, and I will be there on December 3rd to answer those questions again. Thank you. Um, the last time the Premier appeared, I was actually there, and she really didn't answer any of our questions. In fact, she stuck to that $40 million claim that she had, which Joanne Butler debunked yesterday. It's very clear that you would do anything to cling to power. You wasted $1.1 billion, and you refused to be held accountable for that massive scandal. The moral bankruptcy of this Liberal Party is so patently obvious that you are only able to stay in government because the NDP are enabling you. And unlike the NDP, we in the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party have been listening to constituents. My leader is right. People want someone to go to jail, and they want the Liberal Party to pay that money back. Now, while we are here today holding this Liberal government accountable, it is the NDP that are standing on their head and spitting nickels and sending little trinkets and trash Thank to you. the horse racing community. We Thank want you. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Ask questions. The board's coming. I'll do it again. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, let's, let's review the facts. 
It was this Premier, Mr. Speaker, who asked the Auditor General to look at the Oakville plant, who asked the Justice Committee, expanded the, the scope, asked him to look into the situation, has appeared in front of committee, and has taken responsibility for what happened and put a plan to correct it moving forward. It was that party, Mr. Speaker, that spent the last election going around saying that the only way, the only way to have the gas plant cancelled was to vote for the Progressive Conservatives. It was that party, Mr. Speaker, that put out press releases and went on the Twitterverse and made YouTube videos. And Mr. Speaker, it is that party which refuses to talk about their plan, about their costing. It is that party which is not allowing five of their candidates to Answer. come forward to the committee and talk about costing. Mr. Speaker, if you want to talk about accountability or a lack of accountability, you have to look no further than the Thank official you. opposition. Thank you. Any more question? The member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. <laughs> Speaker, New Democrats have uh, repeatedly asked this government to take action to protect cancer services in uh, Windsor and Essex County. Despite grand assurances, cancer patients are set to lose all thoracic surgeries next spring. It seems to the people in Windsor and Essex County that this Liberal government is not listening to their concerns. Speaker, I ask the Premier, is she prepared to stand by and do nothing as Windsor and Essex County lose essential health care services? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the question. I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care actually answered this question yesterday and acknowledged, as I want to, the advocacy that the member for Windsor West has done on this issue, Mr. Speaker, both with the Minister of Health and with me, to make sure, to make sure that the decisions that are being made are in the best interest of all of the constituents in, uh, in the community. So, um, the experts at Cancer Care Ontario are working to ensure that all patients, including those in Windsor, get the highest quality of care. And what that means is that they are looking for uh, ways and assurances that um, outcomes for cancer patients will continue to improve. So that means that uh, hospitals have to meet a minimum volume of surgeries in order for those outcomes to continue to improve and in order yes, to be sir. designated in this case as a, a thoracic centre. So we know that more surgeries are performed at uh, a hospital, the more pro hospital the more surgeries that are performed, the better the outcomes Thank are, you. and that's why the decisions that are being made have been made, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the residents of Windsor and Essex County are mobilizing in order to protect health care services. They're asking the government to listen to the hospitals, listen to the physicians, and listen to the patients who know that moving thoracic surgery to London is the wrong thing to do. Speaker, exceptions have been made before, yet this time the government seems unwilling to consider that the number of surgeries isn't as important as the access to those life-saving cancer surgeries. I ask this government yet again, will they take action to protect health services in Windsor and Essex County, or are they determined to set back and do nothing as the public outcry Question grows and grows and grows. Mr. Speaker, we, we are not going to sit back. We have not been sitting back. It is of, of primary concern to us that those services are the best services and that they are available to all of the constituents in your riding and the ridings in, uh, in the community, Mr. Speaker. So it's very important to us that the people of Windsor have the very highest quality services. So we continue to work with the community. The Ministry of Health continues to work to make sure that the best and highest quality services are available, and that is exactly what the member for Windsor West has been advocating for, Mr. Speaker. Uh, she has raised the issue with us. We will continue to work with her and with the uh, member opposite to make sure that those services are available at the highest quality, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from the Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. I know that our government is committed to investing in youth through our Youth Employment Fund. 
A large part of investing in our youth is making sure that while working, that they are in a fair and safe workplace. The constituents in my community of Scarborough Guildwood are pleased that we're helping youth, as this is a top priority for our community. However, they are concerned about the use of internships, where they are not paid and are speaking out about this issue. Speaker, through you to the minister, are such internships legal in Ontario, and what is the ministry doing to make sure that when young people in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood start a new job, that they will be paid for the work that they do? Great question. Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Scarborough Guildwood for asking a very important question and her advocacy on behalf of our young people. Uh, speaker, the Youth Employment Fund is a great investment, and I'm pleased that over 2,400 youths across our province have already found jobs through this initiative. And that, uh, Speaker, very much speaks to building a stronger workforce and about building safe and workplaces. Speaker, I want to be absolutely clear to all members in this legislature. In Ontario, it does not matter what your job title, your position is. If you work for someone, uh, you are covered by the Employment Standards Act. There is no such thing as unpaid internship. There is a narrow exemption speaker for co-op students in accredited university and college programs, trainees, and, and the self-employed. Any concerns regarding working arrangements can be referred to the Ministry Answer. of Labor's hotline at 1-800-531-5551. And speaker, help is Thank available you. in 23 different languages. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer outlining the strong rules we have on internships in Ontario. I know the families and the young people in my community of Scarborough Guildwood will also be pleased to know that their loved ones are protected and treated fairly. And it is great to hear that over 2,400 young people have already found jobs through the Youth Employment Fund and can begin building their careers. But, Minister, I sometimes hear from constituents that even though they know the Ministry of Labour is there to help them, they are reluctant to reach out. Speaker, through you to the Minister, are formal complaints and reactive inspections the only way that the Ministry will investigate? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I want to repeat very clearly, uh, under the law in Ontario, there is no such thing as an unpaid internship. Uh, if you work for someone, you are covered under the Employment Standard Act and you're entitled to at least minimum wage, vacation pay, etc. Speaker, Ministry has been very active on this issue. I, as the Minister of Labour, has been very actively writing uh, to student groups, to post-secondary institutions, to employers, to job sites to make sure that they know what the rule is and that there is no confusion around our rules. And as I said, uh, Speaker, we will investigate any and all com complaints to enforce our rules. And in addition, our enforcement officers specifically ask about internships during our proactive inspections. In fact, Speaker, this past spring in the budget, we are through that budget, we're investing additional $3 million Sir. for proactive employment standard enforcement so that workers' rights, like interns' rights, are protected. I encourage interns to go to ontario.ca slash internship standards for clarification. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Barry. There you go. Thank you, Speaker. Good question coming up. My question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Security and transportation minister are linked. Uh, and your laissez-faire approach to security has me a little bit worried about transportation plans as well. The GTA already experiences some of the worst gridlock in North America, yet there's no plan and no extensive budget released yet. I'm concerned because venues like the Pan Am Park and the Pan Am Villages are connected by one of Toronto's top 10 worst roads, or alternatively, uh, a streetcar that's already the TTC's busiest route. And you're, you know, according to leaks, your curious solution is to add thousands more vehicles on this route during the Pan Am Games. Minister, when are you exactly going to release the transportation master plan for the Pan Am Games? My yep. guess is they don't have Thank you. Minister responsible for the 2015 Pan Am Pan American Games. I think in the last couple of weeks, I had two uh, scheduled debates with the, uh, the member opposite. It did not happen. Well, he did not show up. And up to this time, I do not know uh, what was the reason for that. But having said that, Speaker, as has been and our practice, once post jurisdiction responsibility and plans are confirmed, we stay then openly. 
and pointed out that the microphone isn't on or it's not working. Can we try that, please? Is it on? <laughs> it's on. Thank you, Speaker. That speaks to our commitment to make this game the most open and transparent games. Speaker, our government brought the organizing committee under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Piracy Act. We require senior executives to publicly disclose their salary on a yearly basis, and we will continue to communicate our progress on the game to the public. Speaker, in terms of security, one Answer. plans are finalized. We will publicly disclose the parts of the plan that will not compromise citizens' safety. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, trying to hide the whole scandal. Speaker, you don't start making the plan midway through the process. I know we know that we're one and a half years out uh, as we keep, you know, as the minister keeps pointing out. But, minister, it's never too early to become the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. I figured out you won't answer anything in question periods, so I've attempted to extract answers through the order paper. And on April 29th, I asked you for a transportation plan. You responded that you're working on it and it will be completed in late 2013. Yeah, we'll get back. Minister, we'll get back. guess what? It's late 2013. Yeah, it is. There's November. no plan, there's no budget, and we don't have any word from you what this is going to cost us. To avoid, to avoid transparency, you even desperately tried blocking a motion in committee by voting against an investigation into Pan Am. At any cost, you're avoiding answering these questions, simple questions. Why is that, Minister? Give us the exact date the public can Question. see your transportation master plan and budget. <laughs> Minister. Thank you, Spanker. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this is not 2013 December yet, so it's not really that late. Speaker, a transportation master plan that will guide our operation as we prepare for the Games. We're also working together, Speaker, on an integrated stakeholder outreach and engagement plan which will be used to guide transportation-related communications to all stakeholders. Speaker, we cannot speculate what the cost of transportation will be at this moment, the cost will be revealed when the plan is finalized. In other games, transportation plans have come out 12 to 18 months before they are underway. And we are Answer. pleased to meet met, to met that uh, timeline. Thank you, Speaker. Question, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, this past weekend, Adam Cargus was brutally beaten and murdered at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre. On Monday, the minister shared with this House the number of inmates at EMDC on the night of the murder, but failed to tell us the number of correctional officers. We now learn that there were only two officers overseeing three units, with a total of 150 inmates, when there should have been two officers in each unit that night. Does the minister believe that this is the right level of staffing to ensure inmate and officer safety? Mr. Community Services and Thank you, Mr. Corrections. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so uh, the uh, the member, you know, is uh, is speculating on you know how, ma how many staff there was there. Um, I know that uh, the uh, the MDC capacity was under capacity that that day. And uh, I also know that uh, you know we have done a lot to improve the uh, safety of both our inmates and our security, uh, our correctional officer in AMDC. And I uh, am going to continue to work with both the union and the management to make sure that the uh, the situation does uh, improve at EMDC. As I said, you know we have uh, installed 350 security camera, a new control model, Answer. six me uh, metal detector, and we have increased correctional officer by 11 in the facility. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Minister. Uh, the Minister is repeating what she told us on Monday, that these new security cameras and these new enhancements are the solution to violence at EMDC. And uh, It's true that the cameras help the police identify and lay charges against the suspects after the fact, but they did not prevent Adam Cargis from losing his life. When is the ministry going to fix the design flaws at EMDC, implement direct supervision, and prevent tragedies like this from ever happening again? Thank you. Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, yes, this is a tragedy, and uh, what happened uh, at EMDC is a tragic situation. And uh, I know that the police are uh, doing the investigation as we speak, so we're not going to speculate. And the coroner office also uh, will do its uh, own investigation, and internally, uh, we uh, will do. Uh, we are doing the, our investigation, and. That's the situation, Mr. Speaker, in our correctional facility. On a daily basis, the, uh, the correctional uh, staff deal with and manage risk uh, of inmate violence, and we, are, uh, we have policy and procedure to do so. But, Mr. Speaker, what yes, I'm, I'm glad about is that from last year to this year, last year there was 244 inmate on inmate assault, and this year Thank you. we've reduced it to 109. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, I understand that you announced the government's intention to review the Development Charges Act on Friday. On October 18th, I, along with all my Ottawa colleagues, joined Mayor Jim Watson to witness the official start of tunneling for the Ottawa's new LRT. Here, here. Here. This, line will, this line will transform downtown Ottawa, but also neighbourhoods like the Avenues in Eastway Gardens and Searville, both in my riding of Ottawa South. And These investments could cause significant development, radically altering neighbourhoods and communities that my constituents call home. This increased density means additional strains on existing critical infrastructure, bus routes like the 114, schools like Riverview Alternative, and hospitals like the Ottawa Hospital in Chio. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister. Question. Could the Minister explain to my constituents and I how this review of development will help, could help my community better prepare for it? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, communities across Ontario are experiencing some of the kind of changes that are happening in Ottawa, and our government continues to work with municipalities to make sure that that development doesn't mean existing taxpayers are on the hook for costs required for that new development. We've heard that municipal leaders feel that the current system limits their ability to recover all capital costs for some of the services and their ability to pay for those vital infrastructure projects. We've also heard from the development community that they want more accountability and transparency. At the end of the day, everybody wants more clarity when it comes to the costs the government imposes. Our government believes it's time for a refresh. It's time to make sure the development charges system still answers our community's needs. And I want to urge you and your constituents to participate in the review. We expect the review uh, to include communities and municipal governments because we want to hear their solid ideas for improvement. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's good to hear about our government's continued respect for communities and municipalities. You're here. Unlike the opposition party, who did not consult with the municipalities when they forced amalgamations on communities across the province, shame. Development, whether it happens in Ottawa or Oliver, Papouge, Niagara Falls, or Northeast Manitoulin, can be contentious. My constituents have numerous questions about land use planning, the appeal system, and the Ontario Municipal Board. Some find the current process complicated, difficult to navigate, and even harder to understand. Minister, our government needs to ensure that our planning system works for, well for municipalities and community groups as well as developers while remaining responsive to the changing needs of our communities. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you explain to my constituents about how they can get involved Question. in this important review? Here, here. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. As a former municipal city councillor, I know that how challenging development can be for communities no matter where they are in the province. However, our land use planning system gives municipalities the tools that they can use to manage growth so we can all build the kinds of cities and towns that we want to live, work and play in. I too have heard from municipal leaders, from planners, from developers, from the public that the rules are too complex, uh, they're concerned about the delays and the appeals are also frustrating. And that's why our government will be holding regional workshops in Kitchener-Waterloo Ottawa, Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay, Peel Region, and Toronto to hear from everyday Ontarians on how we can make the system more responsive to Ontario's changing needs. Because well-planned cities that balance Ontario's need to develop with the protection of our natural heritage mean that our cities are more able to ensure long-term prosperity, yes, environmental health, and the social well-being of all the residents of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. A new question? The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Premier. Premier, the people of Ontario love and rely on our health care system. 
Some say it's one of the defining characteristics of what it means to be Canadian, as it represents a number of our core values as a nation. We define ourselves in terms of our shared responsibilities towards one another and our diverse and inclusive society. We especially help the most vulnerable in our society. It's the Canadian thing to do. Within that context, the Minister of Health bears a sacred trust, and is the person of last resort to whom Ontarians turn to in their hour of need. So, Premier, your government continues to refuse to help Kim Fletcher and others, and others like her. Premier, my health care system includes Kim Fletcher. Why doesn't yours? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, um, I know that the Minister of Health has uh, addressed this issue a number of times, and, and I just want to say that it is, uh, as she has said, it is a very sad and tragic situation that a young woman with children would be, uh, would be in this uh, situation and would, uh, would have such a, such a frightening uh, prognosis. So, um, Mr. Speaker, there is nothing more important than uh, being able to save people's lives and to have the health care system work. But part of that, part of that, Mr. Speaker, is taking the politics out of these kinds of decisions. And that is, that is exactly what we have had to do, Mr. Speaker. Um, we have all the drugs go through an expert committee that undertakes a, a thorough evaluation based Answer, on the best available evidence, Mr. Speaker. That is the process that is in place, and, uh, and we, have to, we have to respect that process. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, <clears throat> Premier, your health care system is devolved into one that creates winners and losers. It is one where you are content to stand back at arm's length, awaiting a decision to reach your Order. health minister from a faceless committee that may or may not meet in a timely fashion. However, time is not a resource that vulnerable individuals like Kim Fletcher have in abundance. Not knowing whether your health minister's committee will find in her favour Anxiety and worry eat up the time she has left to herself, her family, and her friends. Kim Fletcher's case also speaks to one of the core values of the role of the Minister of Health. If she can't help vulnerable people like Kim Fletcher, then what is the purpose of the Minister of Health? Premier, my health care system includes Kim Fletcher. If yours doesn't, Question. your Minister of Health is failing the people of Ontario, and he should be replaced. Minister, Premier. Will you replace your Minister of Health? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And our Minister of Health is committed, as I believe previous Ministers of Health from other yes. parties have been, yes. to evidence-based practice, Mr. Yes. Speaker, because that is the only way to have uh, an objective system, Mr. Speaker, that weighs all of the alternatives. The Committee to Evaluate Drugs has twice reviewed Avastin, but even though, even though that is the case, the Minister of Health has asked the Committee to ensure that they reviewed the most recent evidence on Avastin, Mr. Speaker. She has taken that action to make sure that that review happens, but it is imperative, Mr. Speaker, that we have some objective measures by which to make these decisions. Difficult and tragic as they are, it is absolutely imperative that we have a system in place in order to make decisions, Answer. and that is what that is what we will adhere to, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Temiskamy Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development Mines, Minister. Twenty months ago, the Liberal government announced the divestment of the Ontario Northland Transportation Com Commission without any consultation with Northerners and, as it turns out, any thought about the real costs. Northerners united and forced the government to backtrack. In response, the minister created the Minister's Advisory Committee and has since repeatedly stated that divestment is not the only option for the ONTC. The committee has released its recommendations. My question is simple. Will the minister act on those recommendations? Minister of Northern Development well, and Mines. Thank you very much for the question, and I very much appreciate it. And indeed, uh, uh, we are very committed to seeing that the ONTC remains an efficient and uh, sustainable transportation and telecommunications communications, uh, organization. We are very committed to working with the Minister's Advisory Committee, which uh, we brought together in the, uh, in the early spring. We've had a number of meetings, had some very, very uh, important, and may I say, some very candid discussions about the best course forward. And you're right. Uh, at the Phnom Gathering uh, this past May, I was able to, uh, to 
speak there, and, 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 and I wanted to say publicly at that time that we did not see divestment as necessarily being the only option, and we continued those discussions. You mentioned recommendations coming forward. The fact is that we are still very much continuing our work with the Ministerial Advisory Committee. I'm looking forward to getting together with them again relatively soon, um, hopefully sometime later this month. We haven't got a date quite picked yet. Answer. But again, our commitment is to maintain uh, a system that will work and be, un and be efficient and effective for Northerners, something we understand how important Thank it is you. in northeastern Ontario. Supplementary. Once again, to the Minister of Northern Development Mines. The Minister's Advisory Committee has released its recommendations and they show a clear plan forward. The committee and Northerners are concerned because the status quo is preventing the company from bidding on contracts and it's leaving 900 families in, uh, in turmoil. Time is of the essence. My question is simple. Is the government going to listen to Northerners and act on the recommendations of the Minister's Advisory Committee? Thank you, Minister. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, certainly I will very much acknowledge that the Minister's Advisory Committee has uh, recognized that the status quo is not an option. As I say, we've had significant discussions of looking into all lines of the ONTC, and we recognize the status quo is not an option. We are determined to find a sustainable solution for all the lines of the uh, ONTC. And indeed, there's opportunities, we believe, potentially in terms of the refurbishment division. Certainly, we recognize how important the freight division is, and we're very, very convinced that indeed there's ways that we can actually improve the operations of the ONTC. So we are continuing to work with the, uh, um, uh, the, the members of the uh, Minister's Advisory Committee. They have been very dedicated and they have worked very, very hard and listened very much to all the information that we've been able to bring together. So that work continues. Our yes, commitment sir. continues. Something certainly the Premier feels very strongly about as well. We recognize the status quo is not an option. We recognize the right decisions need to be made. Thank you. We're committed to seeing that the right decisions are indeed made. Thank you. New question. The member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Minister about one of the recommendations that came out of the Ipawash Inquiry Report. Oh. Speaker, you will know that in 2008, the New Relationship Fund was established with the intention to facilitate consultations between the government, private sector, First Nations, and Métis communities. Speaker, constituents of my riding routinely ask about what action the government is taking to ensure that all First Nations and Métis persons have the same access to opportunities that all Ontarians have. Speaker, I think that the, uh, the New Relationship Fund is obviously a great initiative. It's a very worthwhile cause, but would the Minister please tell us about how much progress has been made on this program to date? Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you for that question, Mr. Speaker. The New Relationship Fund provides communities with tools that will support sustainable economic growth, growth that needs to be in place if there's going to be any kind of effective long-term and meaningful change with our Aboriginal communities. The New Relationship Fund supports Aboriginal communities and organizations to engage in consultation with government and the private sector. There are three, ty uh, three types of funding. Core consultation funding is available to First Nations and Métis communities so that they can better engage with government and the private sector on lands and resources issues. A second type of funding, enhanced capacity building funding, is available to First Nations, Métis communities and Aboriginal communities. This Answer. helps uh, to build additional capacity over and above the core capacity funding. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, is that the future prosperity of Ontario is dependent on the full participation Thank of you. all Ontarians, First Nations, Inuit and Métis. No, the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The fund sounds quite progressive, and it appears to be a very solid step at ensuring First Nations and Métis persons in Ontario have access to good opportunities. Exactly. What my constituents want to know, Speaker, is how the fund is actually working, though. What they, what they really want to know is how the new relationship fund is delivering results, and they want to know that the funding is money well spent. Good. So, Speaker, can the minister tell the House of some very specific examples of the new relationship fund, how it's working to link Aboriginal communities in a meaningful engagement with the government and the private sector? Thank you, Speaker. Minister. 
Specifically, between 2008 and 2013, the New Relationship Fund has invested $77.4 million to support over 520 projects in 137 First Nations, 33 Métis communities, and 23 Aboriginal organizations. That's a total of 193 recipients. We've created more than 540 jobs. A further $14.5 million in funding has been allocated for the 2013-14 year to fund another 50 new projects and the existing core consultation multi-year agreements. There are three new core capacity multi-year agreements and 47 enhanced capacity projects, which include first time, the first time three First Nations and Aboriginal organizations. The new relationship fund is just Answer. another step in strengthening our government's relationship with Aboriginal peoples. Mr. Speaker, as I said before, we are all in this together, all Ontarians, Aboriginals, Métis and First Nations. We're going to Thank build you. a stronger Ontario for everyone. Thank you. New question. The member from York Simcoe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. You and your government have had 10 years to come to forward with a plan on retirement security. Yep. You've had a decade to reform our public sector pension system to reduce the $100 billion unfunded liability. You've had a decade to address the lack of financial literacy in this province. You've had years to come forward with PRPP legislation. You have done nothing while every year more and more people see their savings as inadequate for retirement. Now, over the last few weeks, you are advocating CPP reform and possibly a new Ontario pension plan. Whichever it is, it amounts to more mandatory deductions from Ontario workers and businesses. On Monday, you said that an enhanced CPP Question. is your first choice to help Ontarians be ready for their retirement. What is your second choice? <laughs> Minister of Finance. Finance. Friendly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. I appreciate the work and concerns that the member opposite and all members of this House share, and that's the well-being of Ontarians in retirement. And I think we can all agree amongst the, the people in this House, for that matter, all across Ontario, all across Canada, Speaker, that there is a problem. The problem is people don't have enough to retire for those that are relying on CPP alone. And as a consequence, the ministers of finance gathered here in Toronto last week, and we came to an agreement that we need to address it. And we came to an agreement with principles that will be used when the premiers meet at the, at the Council of a Federation next week. And that will be also the premise by which we speak with Minister Flaherty, your counterpart in the federal government, Answer. to encourage him to look That's at right. ways to enhance CPP in a moderate way to protect Ontarians while at the same time stimulating Thank economic you. growth in our province. Oh, Supplementary. Well, that answer suggests to me that your second choice is the idea of a new Ontario pension plan, an OPP that would mimic the CPP. This idea of yours would be an additional payroll tax on employers. An Ontario plan would be new liability for the provincial government because it would pay the employer portion of the pension for its nearly 1.4 million employees. You are aware that the province has a budget deficit of $10 billion and a $280 billion debt. Each year, the province pays nearly $11 billion in interest on its debt. It is time for cost containment and wage freezes, but you still want to spend your way out of economic difficulty. Premier, are you aware that a new Ontario pension plan Question. would cost taxpayers an additional $3.3 billion per year? Oh. Thank you. Minister of Finance. You mean that they'd, they'd save that? Mr. Speaker, why well, think the people of Ontario are looking for, from for come to order. our leadership, Mr. Speaker. They're not looking for a short-sighted vision that's being spewed by the opposition. What they're afraid of is making some tough decisions today for the benefit of our children of tomorrow. We recognize that we are in economic times. We're trying to recover. We're making everything possible to stimulate that growth. But we're going to take leadership to try to protect the interests of Ontarians in future, and for that matter, all of Canada. The opposition would rather stay as it is, 
take things away from Ontarians and Canadians. The other side want to give it away, no less. We have to take a balanced approach. we got to look to the future. We will do that, with or without you. We are yes, looking sir. at all other opportunities. PRPPs is part of the mix, but we have to do better. And that's why we need to encourage everyone well, to come together and look at enhancing CBP. Well, New question, the member from Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Premier and Minister of Agriculture and Food. <laughs> Ontario small food processors have been hit with constant regulation changes that are unpractical, costly, and do not improve food safety. Half of our 267 abattoirs in Ontario have shut since, to, since 1998. The NDP included a motion in the Local Food Act that one of the goals and targets for the minister would be to reduce or streamline regulations for specifically small abattoirs. That motion was defeated by the government. You can't have local food without local processors. Right. Is the Premier prepared to ensure that small processors can keep their doors open? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And he, um, the member opposite, is asking this question in the recent aftermath of my uh, um, my most recent meeting with the Open for Business Roundtable, Mr. Speaker. And that that table is specifically geared to uh, government working with the sector, our ministry working with the sector, to make sure that regulations that need to be changed, uh, need to be loosened or tightened, uh, that that happens at that table. We come to some agreement, Mr. Speaker, and it is working very well. In fact, there were uh, a number of uh, regulations, things like wastewater, Mr. Speaker, that had been raised with me, that have been changed, that are being changed because we heard from the sector that they weren't Working. So I can think of a no. I can think of no better process than actually working with the people who Answer. are uh, in the business, giving us information about the what government's doing that is either hampering them or helping them. So we're going to continue in that uh, in that manner. Thank you. Once again, to the Minister of Agriculture and Food, and I repeat, rural areas need local food too. And currently the regulations, and I, I know that table is happening, but currently the regulations facing processors are one size fits all. And quite frankly, that doesn't work for a lot of mom and pop shops who aren't necessarily now included in that open table process. And those are the ones that process local food for small communities. It's very important. Once again, will the Premier ensure that those process those are also represented and like they could have been in the Local Food Act? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I really do appreciate the question, and this is something that has been raised with me a number of times as the Minister of uh, Agriculture and Food. I understand the, the difference in the capacity of the smaller uh, operators uh, compared with the larger operators, so we are going to continue to work with them. I also know that they are acutely aware of the need to have high safety standards and food security standards in place, and I know you appreciate that as well. I know the member opposite appreciates that as well. Well, so we will continue to work with uh, with all of the uh, processors, and as I say, the open for business table is the place where that discussion needs to take place. I beg to inform the House that uh, I have today laid upon the table a special report from the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. You may have noticed that there were two people in the Speaker's gallery; they had to uh, leave. Uh, one of them was a good school school chum of mine, uh, Mr. Pat Hickey. Uh, was drafted in the NHL in 1973 and played until 1985. I beat him in basketball, but he beat me in hockey. Uh, he played for the Rangers, Rockies, Leafs, Nordiques, and the Blues. And with him was Matt Hurst, a colleague of his that's presently working in the uh, capital markets. Um, we have the member from London Fanshawe on a point of order. Hi. Uh, yes. Thank you, Speaker. I want to just add in to my get, uh, to the visitor introduction that I did that um, Riley plays both as a goalie with the Banta, Bantam AAOR Partners and a center with the Weston Dodgers. She's a very busy girl. We have a uh, deferred vote on the motion, a third reading of Bill 32, an act respecting the Human Resources Professional Association. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Would the members take their seats, please? Would all members take their seats, please? All members take their seats, please. Thank you. On November the 5th, Mr. Dillon moved third reading of Bill 32. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Pollard. Mr. Pollard. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Madame Mayer. Madame Mayer. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nackvi. Mr. Nackvi. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Jassin. Ms. Jassin. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Mangat. Ms. Mangat. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Willett. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 95 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Reading of the bill, Troisième Lecture, Proposal de Loi. We have resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further the member from Brewster and Sound on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, on November 4, when uh, speaking to Bill 36, I used the number, I stated 527 million. I'd like to correct my record, it should have been 527,000. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. As the member, all members know, it's uh, very, very in order to correct a record. There are no deferred votes, no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.